Welcome to The Nation, I'm Rachel Smalley. Earlier this year, the father of Sophie Elliott, the young Dunedin woman murdered by her ex-boyfriend, told our programme how he believed victims were forgotten in our justice system. Gil Elliott made similar comments after the Scott Guy trial in July as well. He's part of a growing group of victims and families of victims who are demanding changes to the way our system works. My guest today is Justice Minister Judith Collins. Minister, welcome to the programme. Thank morning, you for coming Rachel. in. Well, let's start there, shall we, and look at uh, the rights of victims. This is a, a country and a system which has largely favoured the rights of defendants and the state really ahead of the rights of victims, hasn't it? Well, I think that's right. Um, the fact is, is that um, it's only in the last few years that we've seen victims um, have the sorts of rights that they would expect to have. And uh, in addition to that, we've got a victim's code that we're working on at the moment so that victims have particular rights that they can expect uh, from uh, government departments and others so that they actually do get a say in the system. This year the budget set aside around a uh, million dollars, I think, for the, the Victim Centre project. That's not a huge amount of money. A million dollars isn't going to go that far. What else are you doing to support well, victims? Well, the, the Victims Centre is very important because it coordinates all of the efforts of um, victim support and all the other agencies involved um, for victims so that uh, a victim isn't sort of left out there by themselves trying to find some assistance. But um, a victim's code will be very important uh, so that all government agencies, uh, the police, the courts and others will have certain things that they need to do and provide to victims. But ultimately, at the end of the day, our system of criminal justice is very much the state versus the defendant and that's because we've moved from the days of uh, someone personally having to sue um, or take action themselves and you know for many years hundreds of years we've had the state versus the defendant and that's the system we've got. OK, uh, last year we had uh, Simon Power saying he wanted to move the government mm. towards an inquisitorial system. Uh, he wanted that in place before the election. That didn't happen. Where are those plans at? Well, I don't favour that, and I don't favour it for several reasons. The first is you can't take a common law system that we've had, our adversarial system, and then take on and put on parts of a civil system or an inquisitorial system onto that. You either have one or the other, otherwise great injustice injustices will occur. Sure, but there are great injustices, some would argue, that would occur against women and children in the adversarial system as well. It's not a nice court system to go through if you're mm. uh, the child, the victim of abuse or a woman who's been involved in a violent sexual crime. Well, there's no nice uh, court system to go through. The fact is, if someone is accused, for instance, of an offence like rape, it's never going to be a nice system. It's a dreadful offence, uh, a dreadful crime, and unfortunately, if someone is wrongly accused and wrongly convicted, it will have a dreadful effect on them as well. So whatever, everyone's going to have a terrible experience. I don't think the inquisitorial system necessarily brings about a better outcome. And when I've looked at overseas systems, um, you either have one or the other. You can't have a bit of this sure. and a bit of the okay. other. <laughs> so, but, so Mr Power's plans, though, the off the table. Well, that they're not happen. my priorities. We've got big priorities around accessible justice, about making the court system work faster, which would also be good for victims, uh, but also to make sure that we prevent crime. I mean, that's the best thing we can do. OK, let's talk about uh, juries. Nigel Hampton QC, and let me just quote him here. He said juries are made up of the unemployed and the elderly, and that distorts the system. Juries aren't really an, uh, an accurate representation of middle New Zealand, are they? Well, what they are, though, is a, a people, a group of people who try very, very hard to come to the right decisions. And I would say that mostly juries get it right on the day. They have to look at all of the evidence. They try very hard. And those defence lawyers and prosecutors will tell you that they don't see juries that just take a flippant approach to things. They really do try very hard to come to the right decisions. Decisions. You don't see a case at all for reducing juries, the use of juries at all? Well, there have been, um, and there may be around particularly issues around uh, financial crimes, and that's um, the sort of thing that where juries have been reduced. But in terms of uh, the right to be tried by your peers, actually, I think that uh, is absolutely one of our pillars of our justice system. OK, let's look to it, the right to silence, and in particular we can use the example of the case of Ewan MacDonald, mm. and he exercised his right to silence. Now, it's my understanding that that's been brought in to protect people who may be perhaps uh, easily led by a prosecution, they might not be particularly articulate. Uh, I don't think Ewan MacDonald falls into that category. Do you think a judge should be able to compel someone like Ewan MacDonald 
to give evidence. Well, when you say that, what is it you mean? What's, what if the, the defendant just stands there and says nothing? I think the best that we could ever do is to have a situation where a judge might comment on the fact that someone hasn't given evidence. But you can't actually force someone to say something. Um, but look, uh, at the end but of the day... I mean, that might be damning in itself. <laughs> well, though, it, it, well, exactly. But I'm not suggesting that we move towards that. I'm very happy to look at why we would um, remove or certainly have a judge able to comment on it. But we've done that already when it comes to crimes against children. We've done that so that we don't have a situation with the Kahui uh, twins case, for instance, where all these adults stood, stood around and said nothing. Um, now there will actually be an offence if someone takes no action when they know a child is being abused. Also in the case of uh, Ewan MacDonald, that sparked quite a debate about the suppression of other evidence and that a judge would essentially decide what a jury did not didn't hear. Are you comfortable with that? Do you think that's acceptable? Well, I think it is. Uh, if we take a case like that, which has gone through the, the court proce uh, procedure already, if, for instance, the jury had known about the appalling attacks on those little calves, I doubt whether any jury uh, would say, well, actually, I can now look at that man and give him a fair hearing. I think that would be very hard, and I think the judge made the right decision. It's very hard on people, but the but we have to have a system that actually says it is better for an, you know, a guilty person, of course I'm not speaking about him in particular, sure. a guilty person to go free than for an innocent person to be wrongly convicted and imprisoned. Jonathan Tim, perhaps in light of that, the President of the Law Society came out and said it's time that we reviewed as well the use of cameras in court. Yes. And at times there's been accusations that the, the coverage is misleading or vulgar or sensational. Certainly the cameras were very heavily focused on that case. What do you believe? Are you comfortable with cameras in court as they are? No, I'm not actually. I'm not comfortable with the sensationalisation of a few moments. The fact, you know, we, we saw, for instance, in that case, uh, where cameras were uh, absolutely trained not only on the accused but also on his wife, um, on the widow of um, Scott Guy, that it was sensationalised to the extent that it was almost like reality television. And I don't think that does justice any good. At the same token, we do need to be aware that justice needs to be seen to be done. OK, Jonathan Tem says he wants a review. Will a review happen? Well, it's something that will be one of the things that we'll look at. But I have other priorities in justice. I've got a huge work programme and th that will be one of the things that we will look at. Will you look, do you think, at restricting cameras? Is that what you would like to see if you're not comfortable with no, what's happening at the moment? I'm not comfortable with the way that some of the coverage um, is, is in fact um, done. I think it's not, it's not good for the justice system to have little snippets of um, sensationalised um, recording used as a determinant of a, uh, of a case. So you would want restrictions then? Well, I think it's something we could look at. A review? Well, I've said it's something I'd look at. I made it pretty plain. I think I'm actually appalled by some of the uh, coverage. The fact that uh, a jury hears all of the evidence. Um, one of the problems with the cameras used as they are is that we see a tiny snippet, and it's normally of someone about to cry or crying, um, and frankly, that does not give any indication of the evidence that a jury is hearing. All right. We'll pause for a moment there. Justice Minister Judith Collins will return after the break with more uh, from the Minister.